It's always a good time for more videos in our food product development series and today we are talking about costing in food product development and there are a good number of resources. I do want to make reference to my friend Peter Chapman and his SKU Food Recipes for Success um, uh, which was sponsored by Farm Credit Canada and he's got some really awesome videos on understanding cost analysis for food uh, products within retail. I'm going to take it way back into the manufacturing space and focus on what a food product developer is going to be doing in terms of their calculations, because oftentimes that food product developer is not the frontward facing um, individual who's out negotiating for the retail price. But that said, in many cases, these food product developers are owner operators of small businesses. I'm rolling back into food costing and understanding the implications of some of the retail space when it comes to understanding how a food product developer is going to interpret this. So at the end of this video, we're going to define typical fixed costs versus variable costs in manufacturing. We're going to define cost of goods sold and manufacturer suggested retail price. And we're going to discuss typical strategy for costing food products from a food product development perspective. So. Fixed costs. These are things that, depending on your situation, may or may not be readily evident to a food product developer. If you're in a large corporation, you might not see these fixed costs. But if you're in a small business, these become incredibly important. And these fixed costs are the sorts of things that routinely get billed out on a monthly basis. So things like indirect labor, supervisor or administrative wages, salaried wages, and so on. Rents and mortgages, financing payments, lines of credit, equipment maintenance, insurance, business licenses, and so on. All of these sorts of things are what are called fixed costs. And so if you think about it, that rent that you might be paying on your facility, it's not going to change whether you make 100 units of product or 1,000 units of product or 10,000 units of product. Provided you're still within the same physical space, that rent is more or less going to stay the same. And that's what we mean by a fixed cost. The same with salaries, that in general, assuming that you're not going into overtime and having to pay out overtime, someone's salary is going to remain the same, assuming they're on a salary basis, not on an hourly uh, flexible wage basis. Insurance premiums in, in general are fixed cost where that insurance payout is going to be the same every single month. Now inevitably these numbers do change around in standard operations but when small business comes to me and says hey you know what I'm really interested in launching this new product and starting a business I ask them do you have a sense of what these fixed costs are going to be? As we move forward into our next uh, slideshow this becomes important from a sales forecasting model to know when can you cover off those fixed costs and break even in your sales? So variable costs, as you can guess, uh, conversely, is going to be the cost of your raw materials, your ingredients, your packaging, sanitation supplies. And this is where you're paying for direct labor as well. So if you've got um, hourly workers, oftentimes they're considered variable costs because they're going to flex up and down. If you're only making 100 units, you may only need one hourly laborer, but if you are making a thousand units, you might need 10 hourly laborers. Have to think about the, the where does your labor go in the calculation. Oftentimes, depending on bookkeeping, credit cards and payment processing fees are included in variable costs, freight costs, utilities, depending on the situation, oftentimes utilities are, are split where you've got a fixed this is how much we know is going to cost to turn the lights on and operate every time. But in other cases, some utilities are going to be based off of consumption patterns. So, for example, if you are running gas burners on fryers or um, dehydrators and you're only making 100 units, your utilities is going to be much lower than if you were making 1,000 units and you're running those burners much harder. Again, I mentioned this before, hourly workers are sometimes calculated as variable costs as compared to fixed costs, because 
if you are changing your production volume, you're going to change the amount of hourly work that you're going to bring in on a temporary basis. There's our friends Amico and Cafelli, and we miss you if you're watching these videos. We miss you. Send us messages. Say hi. Um, manufacturers suggested retail price. Often when product developers are thinking about what price they need to set, and I see this even more so with students, they'll say, well, my cost of ingredients is this, and my cost of labor is this, therefore my product should be sold at this. And I'm like, well, wait a second. How does that relate to all of your competitors' prices? And if you walk out there with a product that is vastly different from your competitors' prices, you've got to be able to justify it. Now, in the case of small business, we always say, don't try and compete against a mainstream uh, multinational brand because you don't have the same volume discounts on ingredients. You don't have the same efficiencies of production that you would at these large multinationals. But I have to think about the lens of I'm teaching students who very well could be going to work for those multinationals. And so as such, I do want you to be aware of what is your competitor's price range. If you are working for one of these large multinational brands, you do need to be competitive to their price point. And especially if you're going into the private label space, you need to be even more competitive to the price point so that you are able to maintain the price and if possible, even undercut that price. So the big challenge is, especially for small business, you just can't walk into the retail space and say, I'm going to sell my product at $10 a unit if everything else is being sold at $2 a unit. It's near impossible to do that. And so you do need to be really, really aware that there's a lot of price sensitivity. Manufactured suggested retail price is often based off of those competitive analyses that you're going to do to understand what are all of the other price points the same products meeting the same needs are going for. So let's jump into the two core strategies that I see when dealing with product developers. And the first one's cost up, and that's where you're going to go in and you're developing your product and you set out, here's my ingredient cost. So you're costing out each of those ingredients and cost per gram or cost per kilogram, identifying exactly what the ingredient cost is per unit. And then you're going to add in your labor cost. Now, if um, you have to map out your process flow and within that process flow, note how long does it take for each of the unit operations and how much labor is involved in each of those unit operations and how, how much of that labor is active versus passive. But that will then allow you to have a labor estimate so that you know how much each product and the unit cost of labor is going to be. Then you have to figure in all that overhead. That's where you're, you're um, dealing with the fixed costs. So insurance, um, management salaries, ins uh, insurance policies, software packages, um, utilities, and so on. You have to add that in. And then you want to make some profit. That's what we call the cost of good manufactured. Then you're going to have all these different markups at distribution and retail. And that's a cost up strategy. So oftentimes when I'm working with my product development students, they'll figure out, well, I've got this wonderful recipe and I've cost out my recipe. And they're just at step one. And then oftentimes I'm challenging, well, how much is the labor and overhead going to be? Oftentimes that's where we take it in our classes. And that's, that's strategically not incorrect. The challenge is when we start to add up all these markups, we could be completely out of range when it comes to hitting the right price target. So then there's what's called a cost down strategy. And that's where you're working with a manufacturer's suggested retail price or that competitive price range. And you know what that price should be. Then you're going to subtract your margins at retail and distribution. You're then going to have an estimate of what your cost of goods manufactured should be. And then you can split that into your profit, your overhead, labor and ingredient costs. And honestly, this cost down strategy is very, very frequent. And we see this a lot in that oftentimes grocery retailers will say, you know what, we have to maintain the cost, um, the cost to the consumer at this price point. 
And meanwhile, your ingredient costs could be going up or your labor costs could be going up. And there's a bit of give and take between the two. So oftentimes when you're doing costs down, you've, you've got that core price range that you have to be working in and you need to then backstop and figure out who is taking which margin off of that so that you know what your ingredient cost target should be and then formulate specifically to that ingredient cost target. Let's dig into this a little bit more. So cost of good manufacture, that's your total material costs. So ingredients, packaging materials, some people forget things like glues and inks and labels and so on when doing that costing out. But that material cost plus your labor cost plus any additional costs and overhead, that's your cost of good manufactured. And then the cost of goods sold, these two terms are often mixed up in between each other. Again, I'm not a finance specialist. I'm a chemist, <laughs> but uh, I've delved into commercialization long enough to know that these, these two terms are often tossed around interchangeably. But do be really careful about what, when if you're going into a negotiation, to make sure you're really honing in on exactly what the individual you're negotiating with means. Cost of goods sold usually means your inventory plus your cost of goods manufactured. It gives you your final inventory. So you got your finished goods inventory minus your end inventory and that's your cost of goods sold. It's more of a macro value, but you can then do your cost of goods sold per unit and figure out what your unit cost should be. Slightly different tactically, but sort of the same outcome. And that's why the interchangeable within a lot of different people's conversations. Again, I think part of the challenge is that um, the amount of training that people get in finance and business is variable when it comes to being able to go out and make these decisions. Food scientists often don't get enough finance background, and I wish there was more financial training. I never got financial training. I had to learn it all on my own after the fact. And I think there's a lot more need for business and finance training by food scientists and product developers to be able to be part of this negotiation. So again, we are going to focus on cost of good manufactured because that's where product developers have the most impact. So the big challenge is that everybody wants their cut. And I, I mentioned this before, my, uh, my friend Peter Chapman at um, Skew Food Recipes to Success has some seminars and I highly recommend you check those out because he talks about breakdown on the different margins that different parts of the supply chain want to take. But in general, brokers like to take 5 to 15%. Distributors, because they tend to do a bit more uh, full service package, take a larger cut, 25 to 30%. Wholesalers, 10 to 20%. Retailers, these are the grocery stores, they're going to take somewhere in the range of 30 to 50%. And there's a bit of a calculation behind that. So let's say your cost of good manufactured is a dollar Let's say you're working with a distributor and they're selling it to the retailer. So if the distributor is taking 30%, you're selling it to the distributor at $1. They're taking 30%. So a dollar times 1.3 is a dollar 30. And then they're selling it to the retailer at a dollar 30. They want 50%. So a dollar 30 times 1.5 gives a dollar 95. Your cost of goods at $1 has now doubled and your price point manufacturer's suggested retail price is now at $1.95. You can round it to $2, more or less doubling your cost. At 30, uh, 30 plus 50, you're going to say, well, that's 80%. No, it's not, because it's m a multiplier effect that's occurring on these margins. So you've got to be really, really careful and check all of the numbers over and over again to make sure that you're really understanding the difference between margins and percents because they are slightly different. And uh, again, I mentioned Peter Chapman has a really good resource and I do recommend you take that, uh, uh, take his advice into consideration. He's, he's fantastic. So be aware who's taking their cuts. Watch how those margins and percents are expressed because there's compounding issues and there's terminology issues. And make sure to line up those numbers. If you are out there, make sure to ask to see what these numbers look like in a spreadsheet because that will give you a much greater sense of approval. Oftentimes, these negotiations are verbal and people are just throwing around numbers. Ask to see them so that you can do the actual calculations. And that way you can evade a lot of the terminology issues that are out there. 
So let's jump back into these costing strategies for a moment. So let's do cost up here for a second. Oh, I pulled up my Wacom board just to show um, the draft. So let's say our ingredient cost was 30 cents and our labor cost was 30 cents per unit and our overhead was 20 cents and we added 20 cents of profit. We have a dollar for cost of goods manufactured. Now these are just arbitrary made up numbers, but what I want to hone back in on is, take a look, that's 30 cents ingredient cost. And remember when we added in that distribution and retail markup, we were selling this product, suggested retail price at $2. So oftentimes I talk to my students and I say, roughly your, your ingredient cost should never be more than 20% of your product. And it ideally pushing down to 10% of your product. Why? because all of these margins gobble up all of the cost on that product. And so you have to be really, really aware of your ingredient cost. I think of one student project and we let the student get away with it because uh, it was fantastically creative, but she was coming in saying, oh, the ingredient cost is gonna be like $20. And I'm like, are you selling this product for $100 a bottle? And she's like, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, I, I, honestly, Ingredient cost is usually in the range of 10 to 20 percent of your retail price. So we just broke that down into a dollar and yeah, there we are. We're selling it at two dollars. Now, let's do it backwards. Let's say we're selling the product suggested retail price at two dollars. Retail is taking its 50 percent margin. So we're going to take our two dollars and or divide it by 1.5. And that's going to give the price that the grocery store received it at. And then we've got to walk it back again. Let's say our distributor is taking 30%, one, $1.33 divided by $1.30, and that's our cost of goods manufactured, $1.02. Now we're splitting it into profit, overhead, labor, and ingredient costs again. So here's where it's challenging, and I'm bringing up this news article. You'll note the date on this says October 24th, 2020. So this was just two weeks ago. Re retailers are always in the game of changing price structure for suppliers. And right now in Canada, there's a really strong call for grocery retail code of conduct because what's challenging is that the retailers have a lot of control. And if you think about some of the tactics that are used by different retailers where they'll say, we're holding prices steady so that we can maintain our trust with the consumers. But meanwhile, we know that the cost of labor's going up, um, in some jurisdictions, minimum wage is increasing, in other jurisdictions, uh, insurance cost or pandemic pay is adding to costs of uh, manufacturing. Um, what else? Cost of ingredients. In some cases, the supply chain's falling apart, and so the supply chain is is having to pivot, and some of the um, concessions or the bulk discounts that suppliers may have had from certain supply chains have vanished, and as such, the costs of ingredients are going up. And meanwhile, the retailers are pushing back, saying, no, we have to maintain the price structure as it is, or in some cases, even provide discounts to the consumer. This is where it's really, really frustrating across the board and food product developers are bearing the brunt of this because they're often being asked to reduce costs of labor or reduce costs of ingredients. And in many cases, uh, food product development and R&D teams are forced to make impossible choices on reducing product quality or reducing costs of ingredients that just can't happen because the cost of everything is going up with inflation. So. This is an important thing to think about. We, uh, we have another video coming up to talk about um, breaking down these costs within spreadsheets and thinking about break-even analysis. So do watch for that second video and I love to hear your questions and hear suggestions for more videos. Take care, we'll talk to you soon.